The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Has anyone ever phoned you to check up on the radio program you've got tuned in? It happens like this. Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's This Is Your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Oh, sure I do. It's my good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. The Equitable Society has a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. That's one great life insurance plan so naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight's FBI file, The Henpecked Swindler. There is nothing remarkable about the fact that there are various classes of criminals. Because in any group of six million people, there would have to be different shadings of character and mentality. Rated on top are bank robbers, mob leaders, and killers. They are in the business of crime, and they engage in their work for profit. Their standing in the criminal community depends almost entirely on their degree of success. But there is one type of criminal to whom everyone else in the crime world looks up. Because he, or she, makes his living by his brains. And that criminal is the swindler. Tonight's FBI file opens aboard a transcontinental train that is heading westward. In the club car, a distinguished-looking gray-haired man is sipping a tall, cool drink. In the chair beside him, an attractive young woman dressed in black is nervously twisting her kerchief. Uh, I... I beg your pardon. Yes? Uh, could you tell me the time? Why, certainly. It's, uh, exactly 3.27. I is that central time? Oh, no, no, mountain time. We've just entered the new zone. <laughs> Oh, that always confuses me. Well, that's very natural, my dear. Is this your first trip west? Oh, no. No, I lived in Colorado when I was a child. I haven't been back in years. I'm sure you'll enjoy your return. It's a glorious country. This... This is not a pleasure trip. Oh? Oh, good heavens. Please forgive me, dear child. I just noticed you were wearing mourning. Quite all right. Someone near and dear to your heart? My father. I'm sorry. You're uh, returning for the funeral? No, no, no. He died back east. I'm visiting his lawyer to settle the estate. I see. I sure wish I knew more about such things. Why, my dear? What's your problem? Well, here's a letter I received from the lawyer. I can't make any sense out of it. Here, see if you can. Surely. All that stuff there about options, mining properties. I just don't get it. Well, now, uh, this is all quite clear. Uh -huh. uh, your father has the right to, had the right to exercise his option on some rather valuable mining property. But uh, what's that stuff about $10,000? Well, that's what it will cost you if you care to exercise the option. Oh. Say, I see that this lawyer's in Colorado Springs. Yes, that's where I'm going. So am I. Oh? Oh, dear. That's the first call for dinner. I'm afraid I shall have to cut short this delightful chit-chat. Are you uh, walking back this way? Well, I'll follow you a few paces. My compartment is in this car. I think it's wonderful that we're both going to the same place. Indeed it is. 
I hope I'll run into you there. I'll be at the Central Hotel. If I can be of any assistance to you, give me a ring. But I don't know your name. Heavens, that's right. We neglected to introduce ourselves. I'm Colonel Lansing. I'm Rose Dixon. A pleasure, Miss Dixon. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is my compartment here. I'm afraid I shall have to say good day. Oh, well, good day, Colonel. I will call you. Splendid. Greetings, my love. Where have you been? I have just had a most delightful experience. Well? <laughs> a little lady just tried to promote me out in the lounge. <laughs> Is that wonderful? Someone playing me for a sucker? I'm not surprised. What do you mean? It's been so long since you've made a score yourself, you're beginning to look square. Now, Edith. I thought you were going to sit in the lounge to do some promoting yourself. I intended to, but the little lady's technique intrigued me. <laughs> look, you'd better get intrigued with making a buck for us. Because I'm telling you right now, if you don't get some action at Colorado Springs, I withdraw my financial support. Edith, what a ghastly thing to say before dinner. <laughs> In the Denver field office of the FBI, Special Agent Jim Taylor is reading a teletype that has just come in. Jim, you looking oh. for me? Oh, yes, Carl. We've just been given an assignment. Oh, what is it? Well, most of the story is right here in this teletype. Let's go into the office here and review it, huh? Right. Go ahead, Carl. Thanks. Well, what have we got? A swindle, Carl. So far, it's been worked exclusively on transcontinental trains. Yes. Yeah. And briefly, the operation is this. A young woman dressed in morning clothes contacts victim on train. Victim is usually gullible male. Naturally. She explains that she's on way to settle father's estate. She flashes a letter which reveals that Pop has an option on some valuable mining property. I see. That's all that happens on the train. She and victim wind up in the same town. She contacts victim, says father has only left her $5,000, and she needs 10000 to exercise option. Will victim put up the additional five? Now, does a phony lawyer turn up? That's right, Girl and victim each give lawyer their 5000 and then swindling couple disappears. I remember a simpler operation when I worked out of Boston. I know. It's a pretty familiar pattern, Carl, but unfortunately it never is to the victim. And what's our assignment? Uh, those people here in town? No, but they're on their way. Chicago office sent this teletrack. The couple boarded a train yesterday bound for here. Any description on it? Yes, very complete. What are they doing? Hey, their train arrives in half an hour. We should be getting down to the station right now. Is that you, Albert? Yeah. Well, gee, where have you been? I've been worried about you. When did you get here? About two hours ago. I thought you were going to meet me at the train. I didn't say anything of the kind. I told you to come right here to the hotel. Oh. Well, how'd you do? Okay. You promoted a guy? Yeah. He's a very nice man. What's his name? Oh, well, let's see now. I think it was Colonel Lansing. You think it was? Yeah. Oh, brother. I got it written down someplace. Would you show him the letter? Yeah. Did he go for it? Well, he said I could call him. Where? One of the hotels here. Which one? I got that one written down, too. Oh, how can anybody be this stupid? Please, Albert, don't start picking on me. Then why don't you tend to business? I am. Uh, you didn't even remember the guy's name or where he lived. Well, I can't remember everything. Do you know that you've messed up the last three suckers in a row? But I didn't. That little bird brain of yours is sending us right to the cleaners. <laughs> oh, now, don't start that. Well, I can't help it. Oh, Rose, will you cut it out? Well, then you stop being mean to me. Okay, okay. <laughs> Where's the paper with the guy's name and address? In my purse. Well, get it. We're calling him right now. <laughs> Edith! Edith! What is it? Oh, oh I'm sorry, dear. I, I didn't know you were resting. What did you want? I just received a phone call. Well, what's exciting about that? It was from that young dame who tried to promote me on the train. How did she know where to find you? Well, I told her I would be staying here. You mean you had the nerve... Oh, now, just a minute. Let me explain. I'm familiar with her pitch. That's why I wanted her to call me. Look, when are you going to work? I am working. You're what? 
Let me tell you this girl's proposition. She's using the option swindle. We each put up $5,000, give it to her lawyer. That old bromide. <laughs> Darling, I think we can put it to good use. What do you mean? Well, while she's so busy trying to get our 5000 I think I know a way to get hers. That's very unethical. Edith. There's enough legits around. We don't have to clip anybody in our own business. But she approached us. Money you get that way never does you any good. Look, you've been nagging me for weeks to get into action. Now that I've got a live proposition, you back down. I just don't like it. $5,000, my dear. A very tidy sum. Oh, I know. We can have it in our pockets before the day is over. What makes you think it would be that easy? Oh, they're completely vulnerable. We know their game. They don't even suspect us. What's the setup? <laughs> the girl asked me to meet her in front of her hotel. She said that she would then take me to see a Mr. Albert, a lawyer. <laughs> he lives at the hotel, too. And when does all this happen? One o'clock. Now, what do you say, darling? Remember, I guarantee results. You're to bring your own 5,000. That's right. And who supplies that? Well, uh, you do, my dear. That I don't go for. Look, I merely use it to impress them. They never get their hands on my money. But I... Darling, this will be the quickest turnover we've ever made. Jim? No, I'm afraid not, Carl. Did you interview the conductor? Yes, I described the girl to him. He said he remembered her very well, but she got off the train at Colorado Springs. Well, how about the man who works with her? Well, the conductor didn't remember anyone answering to his description. I don't imagine he was on the train anyway. Mm, why not? Well, their pattern in the past has been for her to work the train alone and meet him at whatever town they're using for the swindle. Oh, I see. However, the conductor did recall her talking to a very distinguished-looking gray-haired man in a club car. Uh-oh. You a victim? Could be. Carl, it looks as if we're going to have to take a quick trip to Colorado Springs. Hello. Ah, there you are, my dear. Hello. I'm delighted to see you again, Miss Dixon. Thank you. Well, are you ready to go see my lawyer? Oh, not just yet, my dear. Let's... Let's tarry here in this delightful garden for a few more moments. Okay. Would you like to sit down? I'd love to. <laughs> Did you bring the money? Yes, my dear. I have it right here. You see? Oh, swell. Have you your 5000 Oh, sure. Right here in my purse. Look. Splendid. You look very lovely today, my dear. Honest? I'm so glad that you called me. Really? I had hoped that we'd meet again. See? Yeah. Miss Dixon... Uh, Colonel. Yes? Call me Rose. That would be a great privilege. Incidentally, uh, my given name is Frederick. Oh, oh, that's cute. Rose, let's have lunch before we go to see our lawyer. There's something I want to talk to you about. <laughs> Just a minute. Yes? Is your name Mr. Albert? That's right. You're a lawyer? Yes. Have you got a client named Rose Dixon? I have. Who are you? Well, my name is Lansing. I'm uh, looking for my husband, Colonel Lansing. I believe he had a date here with you earlier today. He had a date, all right, but he never showed up. What? Neither is my client. Wait a minute. What are you trying to pull? Pull? My husband came here with five grand. I tell you, he never arrived. Look, you might as well know this now. I'm hep to the fact you're running a store here. So is my husband. What are you talking about? We knew all about your swindle. That's our business, too. Now, what did you do with him? Look, for the last time, lady, I tell you that the guy didn't show. Well, then where is he? He's got my 5000 Well, if it's any consolation to you, Rose has got 5000 that belongs to me. Yes? Telegram. Just a second. Here. Thanks. Look... I want to know... Quiet, lady. I want to read this. It's got to be from Rose. She's the only one who knows I'm here. Yeah, it is from her. Listen to this. By the time you get this, Colonel Lansing's wife will probably be at your place looking for him. If she is there, here is a message from me and the Colonel for both of you. Drop dead. We will 
reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message to men and women on the way up. Imagine yourself leaving your boss's office, walking on air. Well, thanks again, Mr. Baldwin. Boy, a raise. And a chance to go to the home office. Oh, wait till I tell Peggy. Yes, I'm talking to that one man in ten who has confidence in himself and in his future. If you're that man, then be sure to get life insurance that's designed to order for you. Investigate the Equitable Society Special Life Insurance Plan for men and women on the way up. A plan for people of all ages who expect to be earning more money three years from now than they are today. You're talking my language, Mr. Keating. I'd like life insurance to take my future success into consideration. That's exactly what the Equitable Society Plan for Men on the Way Up does. It gives you these three advantages. First, it provides you and your family with needed protection right now. Second, this equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. Third, this equitable plan is flexible at all times. Can expand or contract as you see fit. That sounds like the plan for me. I'd like to look into it. Okay. Identify yourself as a man on the way up by asking your Equitable Society representative for full information on this plan. Phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. -E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Henpecked Swindler. The victims of the swindle in tonight's case from the files of your FBI could not go to the police and complain because they were criminals themselves. But this case does point up an important object lesson to every law-abiding citizen in the country. Every year, Americans are swindled out of hundreds of thousands of dollars by various types of confidence men. Confidence men who are more successful than they should be because the great majority of their victims do not report the crime to their local police. People who have been swindled keep the matter a personal secret because they feel that to make it public would subject them to ridicule. But those victims do not realize that by their silence, they enable the swindler to carry on his career. So your FBI wishes to pass on this bit of advice. If it should be your misfortune to become the victim of a swindle, Immediately do your part in stopping the swindlers from working on anyone else. Notify your local police. Tonight's file continues in a hotel lobby in Colorado Springs. Special Agent Taylor is standing near the newsstand as his fellow agent Carl Maywood approaches. <laughs> Jim, uh, oh, Carl. Did you come up with something here? Yes, I've just spoken to the manager, Carl. I described the man we're looking for. He recognized him as someone who checked in two days ago. I see. This man described himself as a lawyer. He engaged in the joining room for a girl who arrived last night. But did the manager see her? Yes. She was wearing morning clothes. Well, this certainly sounds like we came to the right place. Yes. And then this morning, the so-called lawyer withdrew $5,000 that he'd been keeping in the hotel safe. If they're about to use the cash, then they're approaching the kill. Right. Where are they now? They're both out. Mm, too bad we can't find out who the victim is. I have an idea. It's that man she was talking to on the train. At least one of the bellhops saw the girl out in the garden this noon, talking to a distinguished-looking gray-haired man. You know, Jim, they may be out permanently. Yes, that may be. In fact, if they've already scored, they may be on their way out of town. Yes, I know, Carl. Look, you drive over to the railroad station, see if they've bought transportation. I'll hop down and get a search warrant to examine their rooms. <laughs> you make out? I just talked to the ticket seller. Well? You say your husband is tall, gray-haired, a flowing mustache? That's him. Well, he bought two tickets for San Francisco. A woman who looked like, like my wife, Rose, was with him. San Francisco, huh? Oh, that's right. Now, where would he go when he got there? Any idea? 
Now, look, this is important. Don't you want to get your dough back? Wait a minute. Huh? I just remembered something. We're not going to San Francisco. Rose? Yes, Frederick? Another bonbon? Gee, thanks. Mmm. You know something, my dear? What? I can't tell you how pleased I am about us. I think I know what you mean. Nobody picking on us, huh? Exactly. <laughs> I sure would have liked to have seen Albert's face when he got that wire. <laughs> <laughs> I think Edith would have been an interesting study, too. <laughs> you know, Albert used to all the time tell me how stupid I was. Really? Yeah. He used to say that I did everything wrong. <laughs> Edith's complaint was that I never did anything. So uh, we take them both for $10,000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Frederick. Yes, my love? Do you think I'm stupid? Of course. I wouldn't have you be anything else. That's the sweetest thing I ever heard. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. Oh, hello, Carl. Where are you? Down at the railroad station. I searched the swindler's room. It looks like they've checked out. I found that out down here. No, oh, how? The girl was here earlier today, accompanied by a tall, gray-haired man. Hmm? From his description, it sounded more like the victim than the other swindler. Yes. They bought two tickets for San Francisco over two hours ago. I see. About an hour later, a male half of the swindling team turned up here. Uh -huh. The ticket seller said he was very anxious to find out about the girl, and he acted quite upset when he heard he'd missed her. Carl, did he buy a ticket, too? No. It sort of looks like she's run out with a victim, don't you think, Jim? Well, he isn't exactly a victim. And what do you mean? I checked with the police, gave them the gray-haired man's description, hoping to save him from being taken. They tell me he's an old-time swindler himself, that they have a warrant for his arrest on an old charge. Well. So it looks like some sort of double cross is in the works, Carl. Yeah. Look, now that our original team is separated, I think we should concentrate on tracking down the girl. At least we know she's headed for San Francisco. Now, she'll have to change at Denver, so I'll call our office and have them pick her up. Chauffeur to take it easy, will you? Okay. Drives him. Yeah. Ease up on the turns, will you? Right. How much further to Denver? Oh, I'd say about another 20 miles. How long did you rent this car for? Just for the day. Look, what makes you think that Rose and your husband will be in Denver? My husband is a creature of habit. He always follows the same pattern. So? So, whenever he's been hot in the past, he always bought a ticket to some far-off place, and then he'd get off at the first stop along the way. Well, supposing he still does that. Denver's a big city. He'll still follow his pattern. He always stops at the same hotel. I know the one he'll go to in Denver. I hope so. Look, our happy little families will be reunited before the day is over. <laughs> Oh, Jim. Well, oh, come on in, Carl. Hotel manager let me use his office. Did you get the call through? To our office? That's right. I've already gotten a reply. And did they get the girl off the train? No, they were too late. And did she get on the San Francisco train? Nope. That puts us right back where we started. I know, but inasmuch as we've lost track of her, I think we should concentrate now on the other half of the team. Oh. Well, I have an idea, Carl. Now, here's what I think we should do. Dear. Yes, Frederick. Well, how do you like your new quarters? Oh, this is a wonderful room. I'm dressed across the hall, so you can always feel that I'm nearby. Well. Mm. Tired? Mm, no, not really. I'd like to get a good night's rest, though, because I want to get up early and do lots of shopping. I had the very same thing in mind. Would you believe it? Edith didn't buy me as much as a necktie in the past three years? Albert was just as stingy. Well, you can rest assured that we will... Oh, that must be the drinks I ordered. Just a moment. Hello, sucker. Edith. Surprised? Uh, what are you doing here? Now, what do you think? Where's my wife? Oh, why, she? Frederick, she's... who is it? It's me, Rose. <gasps> your husband, remember? Oh, golly. Well, get out of the way and let us in. Well, now, now, just a minute. Stand aside. 
How did you know where we were? Oh, that was a cinch, sweetheart. I knew this husband of mine would be lazy enough to follow the same old pattern. And I knew you'd be stupid enough to go along with it. Frederick, what do we do? Well, I... Uh, well, I... for openers, you're giving us back our dough. Oh, no. Come on, get it up, both of you. Now, see here, this whole thing is very unethical. Quit stalling, give us our dough. Sorry to intrude on this little family oh. party. Who are you? A special agent of the FBI. What are you doing here? We've been looking for all four of you for months on charges of violating the National Stolen Property Act. How did you know where to find us? I found you because of your husband. I knew he was looking for you, so I checked all means of transportation out of Colorado Springs. When I found he had hired a car, the rest was easy. Well, Albert? Huh? Who's stupid now? <laughs> four suspects were sentenced to long terms in a federal prison for violating the National Stolen Property Act. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI, which closed the careers of all four notorious criminals, illustrates again the great value of the training received by every special agent before he becomes a qualified member of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. During that period of training, the potential special agent is taught how to evaluate bits of information and also taught that the second investigation of any clue will often turn up some information that was not available the first time. Because of that training and that diligence, the Federal Bureau of Investigation has become one of the most successful law enforcement agencies in the world. And that should make you proud because this governmental organization belongs to you. It is your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you're what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. Or how much protection does it give me right now? Your Equitable Representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options? You bet it does. Your Equitable Man will be glad to give you further facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Wayward Brothers. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Wayward Brothers on This Is Your FBI. Last week, $4,050 was won on Break the Bank. Stay tuned as contestants try for another fabulous jackpot on Break the Bank. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>